Now, I've got to wind things up, and I want to wind things up with a thesis of my own. We've looked across the entire law to see what protection privacy has. We've seen that it has very extensive protection under very familiar headings indeed already. What gaps are there in the existing coverage? What lacunae are evident in the protection of privacy at common law? I've got to confess that I can only spot about four types of situation which really seem to be unprotected by the present law of torts. Four situations. First, I spy upon my neighbor by use of long-range cameras or telescopes or directional microphones without actually entering upon any land of which he is in occupation, either by watching him from my own land or from the public highway or from an aircraft 5,000 feet up. Or, for that matter, I watch and beset him. That might be nuisance, however. I think it would be nuisance. So let's just keep it to one situation. I watch my neighbor's activities. I behave as a voyeur without actually entering on his property. That appears, unless I get into a watching and besetting situation, unless my attentions are constant, that appears to be non-actionable at common law at the moment. If I content myself with just a, an occasional glimpse through his bedroom window as I scurry past his house at night, I just happen to have the binoculars with me, but periodically, now and then, without watching and besetting him, I catch a crafty glimpse. Let's suppose the same person is in the habit of spying on his guests in his own home by means of cameras and microphones hidden in the guest bedrooms. No coverage there under the existing common law of torts. Then there's my instance with the diary. The guest in a person's home who reads his host's diary without actually physically interfering with it. No remedy there. The fourth situation is very different. You get circumstances involving neither breach of contract nor breach of confidence or anything of the kind where a person, let's say by diligently fossicking through the old newspapers, comes up with juicy details of a person's past. This is the Melvin and Reed situation, the reformed prostitute, the former criminal who's been going straight for 30 years, the alcohol uh, addict who has recovered from his problem and has been living a blameless and extremely temperate life, perhaps for 30 years. And then suddenly, in the press or on television, his past is exhumed and thrust into the public gaze. There is no remedy there either under any familiar head of our tort law. There are gaps then in the coverage. What is to be done about them? Most writers and thinkers about this subject concern themselves only with whether the best means of dealing with the situation is a common law tort or the introduction of a statute. I have, I must confess, serious doubts as to whether anything should be done at all. The first three situations I mentioned, the occasional voyeur, the person who spies on his own house guests, the reader of the salacious diary, these are monstrous examples of bad manners, aren't they? terribly ungentlemanly and unladylike conduct. But is that really fit stuff for the law of torts to deal with? Can't we leave situations like that to be dealt with by the sanctions of social opprobrium or ostracism, or perhaps in the peeping Tom situation, the criminal law? Is it really wise for the law of torts to get involved in the doings of those who, by bad manners, cause annoyance, irritation, and emotional upset? to their victims, I would suggest that would be an unwise move and would take us into places we know not what. The one which I confess worries me a good deal is the reformed prostitute situation. Just imagine the feelings of that poor woman 30 years after she'd given up her old life, having it all dragged up again. Imagine the effect on her, imagine the effect on her family. 
she has suffered a very real and grievous wrong from which she may never recover. To quote the previous speaker, she feels bad about it. Yet, under our existing law, there is no remedy. Should the common law provide such a remedy? Should Ontario courts follow Melvin and Reed? I would suggest that it would be rather unwise to do so. I, su I suggest that for a variety of reasons. First of all, just think what we'd be doing. For the first time in the history of the common law, a person would be liable in tort for telling the truth. Truth would be no defense. Indeed, it is the truth which gives the sting to this kind of behavior. Truth would be no defense. So we wouldn't just have to write the chap rewrite the chapter in the books on privacy. We'd have to rewrite the chapter on def defamation pretty radically as well. Justification would no longer be an ab absolute defense. It would be subject to the qualification of malice. Maliciously telling the truth would be actionable. That would alter the whole character of defamation law as we know it. And I don't think it could stop there. I have a terrible feeling that we would very quickly find ourselves on a kind of cakewalk. The ramifications in other torts would be incalculable. I mean that word literally. The rule in Wilkinson and Downton would quickly be snapped up, just as defamation had been. For when the malicious infliction of emotional disturbance, the malicious infliction of bad feelings is actionable, who will need an action for the willful doing of acts calculated to cause nervous shock a concept as hard to prove as it is hard to explain in the language of modern medicine. Who would need Wilkinson and Downton in those situations? You wouldn't need it at all. The new Melvin and Reed tort would do everything for you. And then it would be the turn of negligence because experience, for example, with nervous shock tells us that once you've got an action for the willful damaging of an interest, it's only a matter of time and generally not a very long time before the negligent infliction of that kind of harm is actionable too. So where would we have arrived in three or four short steps? We would have arrived at liability for careless acts, thoughtless acts, unmannerly acts, which foreseeably cause emotional upset to our fellow men. The law of tort would have set itself up as an assize of good manners, I would suggest that is a most unwise and indeed a very dangerous development. Now please understand me, I'm not suggesting that the lady in Melvin and Reed should not have had a remedy. I'm not suggesting she should not have a remedy under Ontario law. I am suggesting that the common law and judge-made initiatives are an extremely unwise way of bringing about a remedy in such a case. The solution, it seems to me, is a specific, carefully worked out cause of action created by statute. In England, there is such a statute. Under the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act of 1974, it is tortious, and indeed I believe an offense, to dredge up from the past convictions for petty offenses and bring them into the public gaze. In Australia, where the courts have always been rather touchy for historical reasons about the dredging up of past criminal records in the family. <laughs> no less than five states and territories have subtly different statutes dealing with this very problem of maliciously, hurtfully telling the truth on specific matters. But always there's the overarching consideration of public policy. It is tortious in Australia, in most of the states, to bring up and show to the public gaze the record of old convictions long lived down, so long as it isn't in the public interest that they be brought into the public gaze. Statute is the best way of dealing with these situations. I would suggest then, by way of conclusion, that there are gaps, but not very big gaps, in the common law's coverage and protection of privacy-related interests. I would suggest, though, that though the time has come when Ontario judges might take the initiative, 
in creating a common law tort of invasion of privacy, they should not be too swift to do so. The ramifications for the rest of the law of tort are too radical and too unforeseeable. The best solution I would respectfully suggest, and I may betray my Manitoba prejudices here, the best solution is a carefully worked out statute dealing either with specific ad hoc situations or creating a general tort but providing for carefully worked out defenses designed to protect competing interests and policies. I'm sorry to have detained you so long. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, John. Uh, so that we won't have too much delay, I'd like to move right on to our next speaker. It really uh, is not necessary to introduce uh, Barry Percival. I'm sure that most of you know him, uh, if not visually, by reputation. But uh, I think I should at least indicate to you that uh, Barry is still a partner in the Benson McMurtry firm. Uh, you probably don't know, but he coached the Osgoode Hall hockey team for five years, and that's why we asked him here today. He was a gold medalist in engin mining engineering at Queen's University. He graduated with a silver medal from Osgoode Hall Law School in 1961 and passed with honors at the Bar Admission Course in 1963, receiving the Law Society third prize. He taught torts course at the Osgoode Hall Law School in 1964-65. He assisted the Ontario Law Reform Commission in the preparation of draft Occupiers Liability Act in 1972 and 1973, so you will see from that that he is eminently qualified to speak to you today on the subject matter which he has chosen. Uh, Barry has actively engaged his counsel in civil and criminal matters in all of the courts in Ontario and uh, still is a commissioner with the Ontario Law Reform Commission. Uh, without any further delay, I give you Barry Percival. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's on. It's on. Yeah. I promise you um, there will be in due course a, a written text uh, for your use. I promise you that I will abbreviate my remarks this morning because first thing you know it will be 1.30 and I'll be libeled by Mr. Uh, Claude Thompson. So I will try to abbreviate it a little bit and unfortunately it's, uh, it's difficult to abbreviate it but I would like to sort of catch the highlights at any event, and certainly the written text will be far more pervasive. This general topic of the 1983 March Special Lectures, Torts in the 80s, is particularly appropriate when one considers occupiers' liability. Before 1980, the law of Ontario with respect to occupiers' liability had been based, as you well know, on English common law. It involved the interpretation uh, and determination of categories and classifications of visitors to premises with corresponding duties of care. That categorization process of the visitor became difficult at best, and most practitioners, I suggest, struggled with rather vague concepts of unusual danger, traps, allurements, imputed licenses. And before passage of any legislation, our courts here in Ontario and the Supreme Court of Canada were trying with some considerable success to modify this rather traditional and rigid approach uh, utilizing the categories and the corresponding duties of care. And in the absence of specific legislation, it was apparent that our highest courts here in Canada would have preferred to decide the occupier cases by using the ordinary rules of negligence. Legislation in England in 1957 and Scotland in 1960 repealed the common law categorization approach. And in 1974, two other Canadian provinces, Alberta and British Columbia, passed legislation governing occupier's liability. I'll have more to say about that shortly. As I pointed out uh, almost 10 years ago in the 1973 Law Society Special Lectures, the Law Reform Commission here in Ontario on January 11, 1972, released a report providing certain recommendations and suggested the provisions of a draft act. You might wish to take a look in due course to see what changes, if any, have been made from those recommendations, the draft act, and the present legislation. It took over eight years for the Ontario government 
to react and pass appropriate legislation. And it's to be noted that all of the recommendations of the Ontario Law Reform Commission were adopted in the provisions of its draft act, with few exceptions, and at least one important addition were eventually embodied in our present Occupier's Liability Act. You will, will remember as uh, members of the profession that the Ontario government distributed a discussion paper to you in May of 1979 relating to both occupiers' liability and trespass to property. Those publications uh, spawned considerable controversy, quite apart from within our own profession uh, to other people. There was significant and considerable input from various provincial organizations, including the Farmers Union, numerous trails and recreation associations, and some, and as a result of that, some significant alterations were made to the revisions of both the draft act uh, proposed by the Ontario Law Reform Commission. Finally, on September 8th of 1980, the Occupier's Liability Act and the Trespass to Property Act came into effect here in Ontario, which legislation drastically altered our common law approach to occupier's liability. Even though it took eight years, the real concern of the Ontario government as to the import of this legislation is perhaps reflected in cancer, in Hansard by our Attorney General on December 1st of 82 when he made the following statement to the Standing Committee on the Administration of Justice. And I'm quoting, like the family law reforms and the provincial offenses reforms, the passage by the legislature of the Occupier's Liability Act and the Trespass to Property Act have had a major impact on the life of this province. These acts took effect on September 8, 1980 after a period of intense public consultation and debate. Following proclamation, there was a public information and education campaign which included newspaper and magazine advertisements, posters, an educational film for use in schools, pamphlets and booklets. This material continues to be in circulation in response to public requests. In addition, the ministry designed and had manufactured the signs many property owners have chosen to use to control access to their property. Once private industry geared up to supply the demand for the signs, the ministry withdrew from production. This area of law was changed to solve two major problems. The first was that the old law as it evolved through court's decisions had become out of date and too complex to be understood by the public. The second reason was that the old law discouraged owners and occupiers of rural land from permitting recreational activities on their property because they feared being sued by persons who might injure themselves. The new law overcame these problems. Mr. McBurtry continued, as I said at the time, these acts represent the most substantial and far-reaching reform of this area of the law in this province since the Petty Trespass Act was at first enacted in 1834. Like the family law and provincial offenses reforms, this represented major change in laws and procedures that people came into contact with on a daily basis. In each of these reforms, there was a substantial process of public debate as the policy and legislation was formulated, drafted, and passed. And that's the end of the quotation. And as I've indicated, legislation involving both occupier's liability and the trespass to property were passed at the same time and received royal assent on September 8th, 80. It's difficult to talk in terms of one piece of legislation when you have to dovetail it with another piece of legislation, and you must have both of these, piece, these acts in your hands when you're looking at any factual situation. I understand that this morning you have in the package that has been presented to you both the Occupier's Liability Act and the Trespass to Property Act. And you'll note in Section 4 of the Occupier's Liability Act that there is explicit reference to the provisions to the Trespass to Property Act. And as a consequence, you must evaluate and consider both these pieces of legislation in analyzing any factual situation. I propose, if I may, to provide appropriate comment Terry, on this new legislation so that you will appreciate the real changes in the law and the law reform in this area. Consider, if you will, for the moment, Section 1 of the Occupier's Liability Act. And you will note that it um, provides specific definitions of both occupier and premises. Section 1A deals with the definition of an occupier and it seems to indicate that an owner of land in possession or a lessee in possession would come within the definition of occupier. However, in addition, you will note the emphasis placed on the concept of control. 
Traditionally, at least here in Ontario, the courts have made it clear that it need not be complete or exclusive control in order to find a particular defendant liable as an occupier. This broad definition of occupier would apply to situations where the proposed defendants are in actual possession and situations where the proposed defendants, even though absent from the premises, still have some measure of control or retain some ability to admit and exclude. That last part of the definition would likely encompass a situation where the area where the damage was sustained is controlled by more than one person, such as apartment buildings, shopping plazas, large office buildings, or even school premises where contractors are performing work for the school board, and any other area where a contractor is performing work for an occupier. This definition is presumably wide enough to cover a security company who provides security guards for large offices, condominiums, or apartment complexes. The security company, together with the actual owner of the premises, may in fact be regarded as an occupier and may be equally liable for any damages occasioned to a visitor. Turning to the definition of premises, that's 1B, the definition makes it clear that the legislation will apply to more than just immovables. The act will, not only, uh, will apply not only to fixed areas of land and structures on land, but also to temporary structures such as staging, scaffolding, poles, wires, trailers, and to vehicles capable of being moved on land or water or through the air. While this definition section of premises seems to be pervasive, it is not exclusionary, so that it would be open for a court to utilize this legislation and apply it to premises that might not come within the precise definition. You will note in the act the clear exception with respect to trains, railway cars, vehicles, and airplanes. The act will only apply to those premises when they are not, quote, in operation, end of quote. You are well aware that there exists other legislation which obviously would apply and the rules of common law which would apply to such vehicles while in operation. For instance, provisions of the Railway Act, the Highway Traffic Act come to mind. Undoubtedly, I suggest a court may very well have problems in interpreting the words when in operation in any given factual situation. Section 2 is the replacement of the common law duty of care provision. And basically, this section provides that the provisions of the Occupier's Liability Act replace the common law duty of care that occupiers were required to show to both the persons entering the pre premises or the person's property brought on the premises. So we go one step further. Occupier's liability, I think all of us traditionally feel that it always has to do with personal injury. It also may be utilized for the purposes of damage to property while on the premises of others. So the act will clearly apply to both persons and their property. It will cover all types of visitors, either wanted or unwanted, and regardless whether they came within the former definition of invitees, licensees, or trespassers. And even before this legislation, our Ontario courts have freely applied the common law of occupier's liability to cases where only property is damaged, but it's obvious from this legislation that the courts are obligated to do so. The Ontario Law Reform Commission had recommended that the proposed act would cover property that had been damaged on the premises even if the owner had never entered thereon. The Ontario legislature, in its wisdom, as you will note, has not followed this recommendation. Section 2 would seem to apply to only property damage when a plaintiff had personally brought the property onto the premises. The legislation would not apply to damage occasion to property on the premises which had not been personally brought on the premises by the plaintiff. So that if you went onto the premises and you brought uh, a television set and uh, it was damaged on somebody else's premises, then you could seek recovery. If it was taken there by a cartage company, you would not. It seems anomalous, but that's what the legislation seems to imply. You will appreciate the saving provision of this section, quote, subject to section 9. This exception preserves the obligations owed by certain persons such as innkeepers, common carriers, and baileys, where there's a higher duty of care may be owed pursuant to either common law or other legislation. The real test in this new legislation is section three, bracket one, which is the duty of care section. In section 3, one establishes a common duty of care owed by all occupiers. 
And the duty, as you read it, says the duty is, quote, to take such care as in all the circumstances of the case is reasonable, to see that persons entering on the premises and the property brought on the premises by those persons are reasonably safe while on the premises. This section truly represents the essence of the reform legislation. The terminology in section 3.1, I point out, is somewhat different from the common duty of care which had been earlier proposed by the Law Reform Commission. As I've indicated, the enacted legislation clearly shows that the duty of care applies to both persons and property. What is reasonable care will be a matter for determination by a judge and or a jury. To this extent, I suggest this will result in a certain loss of predictability, but on the other hand, a court will no longer need to concern itself with categorizing the plaintiffs nor further concern itself with the nebulous concepts of traps, unusual dangers, and allurements. There will only be one value judgment necessary. The question must be, did the defendant take reasonable care to ensure that persons and their property are reasonably safe while on the defendant's premises? Apparent to you undoubtedly that the concept of reasonable care follows the Donahue and Stevenson general principles of negligence. The wording of the section would allow the court to consider all of the circumstances of the case before deciding whether reasonable care had in fact been exercised by the occupier. The test of foreseeability would undoubtedly be applicable with all its attendant problems. For instance, in normal circumstances, an occupier would not reasonably be expected to foresee the presence of a burglar on his premises late at night. On the other hand, an occupier engaged in construction work in an urban area should reasonably foresee the likelihood of children being attracted to and wandering onto the premises under construction. On first blush, then, as you read the act, you say, oh, reasonable care, Donahue and Stevenson, boy, this is opening the floodgates. We're all going to recover, and all those injured parties and their property are going to be having a successful cause of action. But wait, you must carry on. Section 3.2 on the next page talks in terms of both conditions and activities. And it makes it clear that both the condition of the premises and the activities carried on within the premises still must be subject to the scrutiny of the general duty of care. So that the danger causing personal injury or damage to the property may either be the inert physical condition of the premises or structures, or it may be the, the actual activities being carried on. It's difficult to appreciate how this subsection will be interpreted in conjunction with 3.1. You'll note that the word danger is not utilized in section 3.1. There's no reference to danger in the general duty of care. On the other hand, the word danger is certainly utilized in section 3.2 and earlier in section two, which latter section provides for the superseding of the common law duty of care. Why was that done? I have no idea. Section 3.3 talks in terms of the exception to the duty of care. And this subsection provides a clear exception. And the duty of reasonable care would apply except insofar as the occupier of the premises is free to and does restrict, modify, or exclude his duty, end of quote. I suggest that these words would probably, in other words, except insofar as the occupier is free to, would probably be interpreted by a court to mean that an occupier's power to restrict, modify, or exclude his duty of care should be no greater than under common law. This may involve a consideration by the court as to whether the occupier is legally capable of excluding liability to entrance by, by means of an express agreement or the exhibition of notices disclaiming liability for damage or the provisions of any bylaw, rule, or regulation the occupier may have power to make and which would be legally binding on the plaintiff. This point of cross-reference should be made to section four, which provides for posted notices under the Trespass to Property Act, and also to section 5.3 of the Occupier's Liability Act, which requires the occupier must take reasonable steps to bring such restriction, modification, or exclusion to the attention of the plaintiff. And I found as I was going through both these pieces of legislation, you're flipping back and forth and back and forth, and it's not easy. One wonders whether the cake is worth the candle, but I think it makes sense when we finally get to the end of it. We turn to the real iniquitous part, if I may, skipping over 3.3 a little bit, but going to section four and, and, and the, the 
side note says, risks willingly assumed. You thought the floodgates were open, here's where they close. Section four is the one section of this new legislation which will undoubtedly be relied upon by counsel for defendant occupiers. This section purports to utilize the common law defense of valenti non fit injuria for the purpose of exonerating from liability individuals who are occupiers of recreational and rural lands specifically described in section 4.4 of the Occupiers Liability Act. And look down at 4.4. See what sort of premises are protected by the provisions of section 4. As I told you earlier, most of the re earlier recommendations of the Law Reform Commission were accepted by the Ontario government for the purposes of this new legislation. I point out to you that the Law Reform Commission did not recommend the inclusion of this Section 4. I suggest to you that Section 4 was probably insert inserted in the legislation as a result of the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Kerr Addison and undoubtedly because of the effect of the powerful lobby exerted upon all political parties in the Ontario legislature by various pressure groups who seek to encourage the recreational use of rural lands. The Kerr Addison case was, of course, a snowmobiler uh, driving a snowmobile on a uh, road allowance of the Kerr Addison property near Kirkland Lake. Presumably, Section 4.1 would apply only where the, when the plaintiff is found to have willingly uh, accepted the risk of injury. You'd say, well, that's what it seems to say. In such a case, the occupier no longer has the general duty of care, and, but he has a limited duty of care in these situations. That duty is to not create a danger with the deliberate intent of doing harm or damage to the person or his property, and to not act with reckless disregard in the presence of the person or his property you will well appreciate that the common law defense of Valenti has been strictly construed by our courts, but it remains to be seen whether our Ontario court will determine whether the words willingly assume the risk are equivalent to the common law defense of Valenti. You will recall that the defense of Valenti was restricted to factual situations where the risk was fully appreciated and understood by the plaintiff. In addition, Valenti did apply in occupier cases where the plaintiff was effectively found by the court to say, I knew and fully appreciated the risk of injury to myself, but notwithstanding my knowledge of that risk, I willingly went on the premises where I subsequently sustained injury. If that was the finding under common law, there would have been no liability in the occupier. You will well appreciate that this particular subsection 4.1 represents the classic embodiment of the recognized former common law duty of care owed by occupiers to trespassers. So with respect to certain rural lands, the limited duty of care is what we all recall was that which we owed to trespassers. Section 4.2 is the criminal activity exception. And if a person enters with the intent to commit a criminal act or is in the commission of a criminal act and while on the premises receives injury, that person is deemed to have willingly assumed all risk of injury. Deemed, that's the word, deemed. In that event, the limited duty of care would apply. The word criminal act is not completely defined. I suggest there may be some judicial uncertainty as to whether the actions of the plaintiff would have to have been punishable under the criminal code for this particular subsection to apply. It's questionable whether an offense or an attempted offense, say under the Food and Drug Act or the Provincial Offenses Act, would in fact place a plaintiff within the ambit of this section and only and, and significantly reduce uh, the duty of care owed to him by the occupier. Section 4.3 talks in terms of trespass and permitted recreational activity exception. And provided a plaintiff comes within this subsection, he's deemed to have willingly assumed the risk of injury and there is only the limited duty of care owed to him. A careful reading indicates that this subsection only applies with reference to the premises specifically described thereafter in section 4.4. Section 4.3a talks in terms that the limited duty of care only would be owed in cases where entry is prohibited under the Trespass to Property Act then you start to have to start to flip 
You must then cross-reference this legislation with the Trespass to Property Act, and that's the other um, bill or the other act that you have before you, and you then must consider the provisions of Section 3 to 7 of that legislation before deciding what it happens to your individual plaintiff or your particular client. And broadly speaking, you will see in those five specific sections of the companion legislation, sections three to seven, that notice whether oral or in writing is necessary to prohibit the entry onto the premises. If you look at 3.1, you will appreciate that entry is automatically prohibited and no notice is required in the case of certain premises such as gardens, fields, or other land under cultivation, lawns, orchards, vineyards, woodlots, or premises enclosed in a manner that indicate that the occupier's intention to keep the person off or to keep animals on the premises. If you look at Section 3.2 of the Trespass to Property Act, uh, there is a presumption that access for a lawful purpose to a door by means apparently provided and used for the purpose of access is not prohibited. Accordingly, it would seem there is implied permission in such cases and entry for lawful purposes would not be prohibited. It would seem, therefore, that salesmen, utility tradesmen, and other plaintiffs with lawful intent may approach, approach the door of the premises and such entry would be not prohibited under the Trespass to Property Act. Section 4.1 of the Trespass to Property Act provides for limited permission signs. And Section 4.2 provides for limited prohibition signs. Section 5, the same legislation provides that notice of prohibition may be given orally in writing. May, be, may also be given by clear visible signs posted on the approach or by the marking system set out in Section 7. It will become apparent to you that the method of giving notice of prohibition does not take into account the age or understanding of the person seeking to enter the premises. A child of tender years entering the premises and who cannot read is hardly able to understand the significance of posted signs prohibiting his entry. Notwithstanding the fact, if the signs are there, the child's legal rights will be greatly affected by the posting of them. If the signs are found by a court to be adequate and only substantial compliance is required, then the plaintiff of tender years who cannot even read is deemed to have willingly assumed all risks and the occupier owes to that child only the limited duty of care set out in 4.1 of the Occupier's Liability Act. Again, however, I stress that this would only apply to the premises specifically described in Section 4.4 of the Occupier's Liability Act seems anomalous that a child of tender years who would ordinarily not likely to be capable of contributory negligence, you always think in terms of age six or seven as being that threshold, but a child who may be age four, who can't read, because the signs are there, has only a limited duty of care owed to her or him. And, and she will be deemed under section four to have willingly assumed all risks of injury. And it will only be where the occupier acts in the heinous manner set out in 4.1 uh, that such a child will be permitted to recover. So that you see what the door was open, but it gets slammed shut. And it gets slammed shut, unfortunately, for, for some unfortunate individuals such as children. Now, it has also been noted that the terminology in section 4.3 of the occupier's liability is disjunctive and its application is consequently wide. The defense net, I suggest, is then spread wide and the plaintiff will enter on to specifically describe premises at their own great peril. Turning to section 4.4, you'll note that it provides the type of premises where this limited duty of care would be applicable. In six subheadings, generally speaking, it includes rural premises, golf courses unopened for play, utility right-of-ways, private roads, recreational trails, and unopened road allowances. You will note there is a significant exclusion of the word structures on utility rights-of-way in this definition. As a consequence, hydro towers, high-voltage electrical lines, and power substations would not apparently come within Section 4 with its limited duty of care.
I'm of the view that Section 4 provides considerable uncertainty in this legislation. Our courts may very well find it difficult to interpret it. You can conjure up an anomalous situation. For example, E.P. Taylor has a large home and extensive grounds on a farmyard on Bayview Avenue, smack dab in the middle of the city of North York. If a person entered this property, a Section 4 defense might be available to the occupier because the premises might well come within the definition of Section 4.4 of the Occupier's Liability Act. It doesn't make sense, but that's what it says. What is rural lands, what is suburbs, what is urban land may very well be the subject matter of considerable dispute in forthcoming trials. I point out to you that this limited duty of care in Section 4 is almost identical to the duty of care required to be shown by occupiers to the operators of motorized snowmobile vehicles on their land. The Motorized Snow Vehicles Act, however, applies to all types of land and not though just those under Section 4.4. Section 5.1, carrying on and putting the Trespass to Property Act behind us, Section 5.1 talks in terms of um, restricting or excluding by any contract to which the plaintiff is not a party. And it, it, it really embodies the common law rule that a person who is not a party to a contract should not be bound by its term. This subsection will have application despite the provisions and leases uh, between landlords and tenants, hold harmless clauses in contracts between owners and contractors, and other types of contracts where provision of no liability are set out. You've seen them all, you've seen those, that legislation, and a plaintiff comes in and it's often pleaded. Well, this particular provision exonerates us. Section 5.1 says that it cannot be restricted by such provisions. The plaintiff would not be bound by these provisions and they may still be utilized, but they may still be utilized clearly in third party proceedings between the respective defendants. Covenants and conditions and leases where the landlord is the occupier of entrance halls, stairways, and elevators would be governed by this subsection. Covenants and conditions would not affect the rights of the plaintiff and would neither uh, reduce nor exclude the statutory common duty of care of the landlord in his capacity as occupier. You note section 5.2 is the extension of liability by contract. And this preserves the accepted right of an occupier to avoid liability for the dangerous acts of independent contractors or persons for whom he is not responsible vicariously or otherwise. Section 5.3 talks about the reasonable steps to inform. And it provides that where there are such restrictions, modifications, or exclusions in the contract, which contract would ordinarily bind the plaintiff, reasonable steps must be taken by the occupier to inform the plaintiff of such restrictions. Earlier I had commented on that subsection. Section 6 deals with independent contractors. This says, uh, 6.1 attempts to embody the exceptions to the general common law rule which applied in situations where independent contractors have been engaged by the occupier to perform work on the premises of the occupier and by their negligent work cause personal injury to persons or their property. And the terminology talks in terms of quote, and if it was reasonable but the, that the work performed by the independent contractor would have been undertaken. I suggest that is inserted to cover the common law exception to the rule in situations where the mere embarking on a given type of work in itself creates a substantial risk of harm to persons entering the premises. These would be the so-called extra hazardous activities performed by independent contractors. You'll forgive me, I'm skipping along, but as I say, I think that there's growling in the audience by stomachs and I've got to give you at least an hour for lunch. A particular difficult example in relation to, uh, to independent contractors might be the owner of a shopping plaza who engages a, a contractor to salt and sand snow and ice conditions within the shopping plaza. Would the owner of the plaza merely by entering into such a contract and thereafter satisfying himself that the contractor was both competent and was doing the work thereby exonerate himself from liability for personal injury suffered by entrance to the plaza. If a contractor is a man of substance or well insured, then there should be no problem, but that may not always be the case. As a consequence, a court might make it extremely difficult for an occupier to satisfy all these requirements in order to achieve absolution from liability. 
6.2 talks in terms of two occupiers and one independent contractor. And it's a saving provision, which you would naturally expect that if, uh, if there are two occupiers and there's only one contractor and the second occupier would also be saved harmless by this subsection. Section 7 talks in terms of occupier and contractual provisions. It's, it's rather neat, and I won't go into it, but um, there, if you take a look at this, Section 7 and Section 8, you've got to distinguish between ordinary contracts and tenancy agreements. And there is a distinction as to when, whether you're restricting or excluding liability or expanding it. And you have to carefully read Section 7 and 8 to know whether or not it applies to contracts or tenancies created before or after September 8, 1980. I won't take the time this morning or this afternoon to go through that, but I ask you, if you're dealing with particular uh, contracts and tenancy agreements, read carefully Section 7 and 8 uh, so that you may uh, understand the problem with respect to whether or not the lease or the contract was enacted prior to September 8, 1980. Section 8.1 talks about the occupier landlord and it reverses the common law rule which was exemplified in Cavalier and Pope, which you'll all remember undoubtedly, which was to the effect that the lessor of premises would not be liable to a person lawfully on the premises other than tenant. Section 9, if again, moving on, in order for expediency, and as I said, my, I have other comments with respect to these sections which will be in the written text. Section 9, one talks about uh, preserving any higher obligation which may be owed to certain people under common law or by other legislation, and that the provisions of the Act would not detract or affect such higher duties of care. This particular subsection attempts to preserve the higher legal obligations which exist at present in at least three unique legal re relationships, all of which involve property and only two of which involve potential liability for personal injury. Those are the laws of bailment, innkeeper's liability, and safe carriage. 9.2 talks in terms of master and servant, preserves the rights and duties of the liabilities resulting from the master and servant relationship, and it says that workman's compensation, for instance, would be still paramount to the provisions of the Occupier's Liability Act. Section 9.3 talks in terms of the Negligence Act, makes it abundantly clear that contributory negligence is still an issue in relation to an action brought by a plaintiff against an occupier. The plaintiff may be able to demonstrate a breach of the duty of care. The defendant, on the other hand, may have certain things to say about the plaintiff's rights of recovery by reason of the plaintiff's own contributory negligence. Section 10.1 talks in terms of crown liability, and uh, it's become uh, common law. The crown could not be held liable for negligence, and the movement of the legislature recently is to make sure that it's abundantly clear, and they have to specifically set it out in legislation to make the crown bound by the provisions of the Occupier's Liability Act so that provincial and federal office buildings, post offices, LCBO stores would all come within the ambit of the Occupier's Liability Act whether you're drunk or sober. Section 10.2, public roads and highways, and it makes it clear that neither the Crown nor any municipal corporation would be liable as an occupier when the premises in question involve a public highway or a public road. The Municipal Act, the Highway Improvement Act, uh, provide details legislation in this regard. Section 11 talks in terms of the time of application, talks in terms of not to be retrospective, and it only affects causes of action which came into force on September 8, 1980. As I've indicated, the only substantial departure by the legislature from the recommendations made by the Ontario Law Reform Commission are found in Section 4 of the Act. This particular Section 4 establishes different classes insofar as premises are concerned, and by what I describe as an insidious deeming provision and what I perceive to be a false application of Valenti, a rural and recreational landowner is substantially, if not totally, insulated from occupier's liability. It's hoped that a court, particularly with respect to children, will strive to circumvent 
the provisions of Section 4, and the imposition of its restricted duty of care. Since 1974, there have been a number of British Columbia and Alberta decisions in occupiers' liability following that legislation coming into force in those provinces. While these decisions are not binding on our Ontario courts, they may be a persuasive influence in interpreting the provisions of our legislation. However, I point out to you that neither the Alberta or British Columbia legislation is as pervasive as our Occupiers' Liability Act when read in conjunction with the Trespass to Property Act. But notwithstanding that caveat, these judicial decisions may provide a useful basis for the commencement of your research in any factual situation where Occupiers' Liability Act may apply. I have made a list of these decisions which will be provided in Appendix B of the written text of this address, and they're right up to date. Why those decisions may be useful is by reason of the total paucity of Ontario decisions on our new legislation, notwithstanding the passage of almost two and a half years since royal assent was given. I have considered all of the books, I've conducted a computer search, and there is not one single reported judicial decision here in Ontario applying or interpreting the provisions of the Occupier's Liability Act. I suggest to you either the provisions of this legislation are so clear that parties find it easy to resolve their differences, or else the provisions are so complex that no one wish, wishes to run the risk of litigation. I'd like to think that the former proposition is true. I have an extensive uh, insurance practice. I know that the insurers take a benevolent view of the legislation. They feel that it was an attempt by the legislature to open the gates wide. They are not hiding behind Section 4 as one would think they would, and I believe that cases are being settled long before they get to litigation. Thank you very much.